Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. My name is Deacon Jonathan Stord and this is our New Year's special, our New Year's Eve special. We have a very appropriate uh, book and topic to talk about. We're talking about the book Pairings, the Bible and Booze with the Reverend Dr. Matthew Anderson. Hello, Dr. Anderson. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. We, we've been trying to set this show up for a little while. It, it, it's just so great that it's going to work out to be part of our, our holiday programming. Now, before we dive into your fascinating book that I think people are really going to enjoy, really enjoy hearing about, really enjoy reading, everybody buy a copy. Uh, I know that everybody who watches and listens to the show loves to party. Um, <laughs> however, if you can't drink alcohol, you can also party with alcohol-free versions of each of the drinks that Dr. Anderson has uh, put in. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I have to do our commercial first. Uh, we can't do the show without your financial help. So you can keep the show going by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can also put a cap on that uh, if you're scared that we're going to do a, a million pieces of media or whatever so that it fits your budget. You can uh, help us... Uh, sustain the show in return you get access to the shows early and we're also trying to give other things to our patrons and if you have any ideas or you want something in return for signing up j just let me know I'll, I'll try the logical thing to do would be is tape shows and put them behind a paywall that you have to pay for but we don't want to do that we want to get all this uh great stuff out there uh, uh free and available and accessible for everybody you can also do one-time donations at paypal.com gnostic and i know these are trying times and they're i mean i know this is our new year's special i don't feel that optimistic about 2022 maybe in a year's time i'll be proven wrong but all that said you can also help us out by telling people about the show sharing your favorite episode uh emailing it to a friend putting it on your social media liking subscribing leaving reviews unfortunately the algorithms are the archons that actually run this world so you you can help us work with them instead of against them by uh uh, uh doing those those things like liking subscribing leaving good reviews okay the commercial is over um Dr. Anderson, tell us. Okay, here's here's my opening question. I'm bringing up the, the question sheet. A multi-part question. What was the inspiration for your book? How did it come to be? What is its quote-unquote goal? And why is it like a sampler? Uh, well, it came to be because um, I, I, I'm a teacher. I, I teach biblical studies. And uh, like a lot of fields, biblical studies is this thing where the people within the field um, talk about a lot of things that don't necessarily hit the sidewalk. They, they don't get out to people on the street. Um, and, uh, and so I'm always looking for some way in order, uh, some way to publicize, to kind of go public facing with the research that we do in biblical studies. And uh, probably it was some night when I was sitting around with a, uh, a glass of wine and, um, and thinking, how can, we, how can we talk about this in a way that people can understand? And, um, and, it, and the idea of pairing the idea of pairing certain passages and certain themes with uh, different types of alcohol came to me. And part of the reason for that is that um, j the same way that uh, wine, this glass of wine, which is from Argentina, um, is not the same thing at all as uh, Molson Canadian, and yet they're both booze. They're both alcohol. Um, um, those two things, so they're within a category, but they're two different things. Uh, it's the same with the Bible. Uh, with the scriptures. And so what you do is that you have the book of Isaiah and the book of Revelation are very, very different uh, creatures. Um, and yet they are both uh, within this canon. And and so I wanted, I wanted firstly to be able to tell people this is a collection. Uh, these are a type, but it doesn't mean that they're all the same thing. And one of the problems with uh, one of the many things that's going on with our world as we are about to enter 2022 uh, tonight is that um, it's too many people um, take the Bible without actually uh, learning anything about it. And so it was, it's an attempt to try and teach people about these scriptures, which even for people who are not believers or not followers, um, there's, it's still incredibly important, uh, the scriptures, because they, they have affected civilization, they've affected Western society, uh, they've changed the course of the world, um, their misinterpretations have changed the course of the world. And so uh, I wanted to just do some educating and I wanted to do it in a fun way. And um, probably it was partly born uh, out of this glass of wine. Um, so I had a chance to do it that way. 
<laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, you know, reading the book, thinking about the book, uh, I, I think of my, my Scots Presbyterian ancestors who would be spinning in their graves over such a book. H have you had any pushbacks or bad reactions, people saying you can't combine the, the, the Bible with alcohol? Um, I think your Scots Presbyterian ancestors might like the chapter that I wrote on uh, pairing the Gospel of Matthew with uh, Lefroyc, um, Lefroyc uh, Isla Scotch. And um, I, part of the reason I talk about that is, is that uh, uh, the Gospel of Matthew is a very stern gospel. And it's very different from Mark and Luke and John, the other three that are in the um, canon of the, of the Christian New Testament. And, um, and uh, to me, a stern uh, sort of um, uh, that knows the rules um, and yet has this warmth within it is kind of like a good Scots Presbyterian, at least the ones that I know. And I know a few Scots Presbyterians who, who may, who may not uh, drink very much, but they do like their little dram of uh, of uh, of Scotch every now and then. Um, so uh, I haven't really had any pushback at all, to be honest. Gotcha. Um, and that's great. I mean, it seems to have been very, very well received um, by everyone who's read it. Fantastic. Yeah, well, I was thinking my, my Scots Presbyterian ancestors, but my my Irish uh, Catholic uh, grandfather, he would have paired each book of the Bible with rum and then church with rum and praying with rum and funerals with rum and baptisms with rum. Okay, uh, how did you come to choose the passages and the books that are that, that are in uh, uh, your book? Um, I will I almost always started, well, I started with the texts because really I was trying to teach. And so I started with the texts and um, and it was always a question of, um, in most cases it was, uh, there was a text that has a sort of a theme. So uh, there's a very strong, um, a, there's a very strong uh, decolonizing theme throughout this book. It's, yeah. it's very, very big on, um, on justice issues. And, um, and so I started thinking, I guess, about that. And I was thinking about the book of Joshua, in part because I read an indigenous, um, an article by an indigenous scholar, Robert Warrior, some time ago, in, in which he, t uh, the title of the, of the article is, uh, if I hope I get it right, Cowboys, Canaanites, Cowboys and Canaanites, and the Promised Land, or Cowboys and Canaanites. And um, in, in it, uh, uh, Robert Warrior says that indigenous uh, Christians, um, uh, they, he said that we, uh, we identify far more with the Canaanites than with the wandering Hebrews who uh, came in to uh, settle and to colonize the Holy Land um, under Joshua. And when you read the book of Joshua, it's really a a difficult book. It's a. It's about colonization. It's about uh, death and destruction. It's about moving out an indigenous population, and uh, various people have worked uh, around that in different ways and trying to understand it. But it was really important for me to read an indigenous scholar who looks at it and says, "Look, this just does not. Uh, we are on the other side of this uh, from the way that most Europeans have understood it." And um, as Canadians, uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, my grandparents. Uh, immigrated from Norway uh, and elsewhere to uh, to the West. And when they came, they were literally invited by posters that called Western Canada a land of milk and honey. So there's a good example of how um, you don't have to be in church to be influenced by uh, readings or misreadings of the Bible. So I wanted to talk about things like that. So I, I chose uh, texts like Joshua to be able to pair it. And then I thought, what can I pair it with? And actually that's one of those, uh, all of the chapters are paired not only with alcoholic drinks, but also with alcohol-free drinks um, for many, many uh, good reasons. Uh, many people choose not to drink alcohol, health reasons, uh, addiction reasons, um, reasons of, uh, of taste even. Um, uh, so in this particular case, uh, tea, it makes a really fine pairing as well. Uh, and so I talk about tea in that chapter because um, decolonizing uh, our drinks is very important when we talk about tea, which is a favorite drink of mine, for instance, and yet is so wrapped up with the history of colonization. So I, to, to answer your question, I, I normally I started with the passage and I wanted to make sure that I had Genesis. So I talked about apple cider with Genesis and I wanted to just make sure that I talked about Revelation, the end of the Christian Bible. And so I talked about uh, Bloody Caesars, which maybe we'll get around to. Um, and in between, uh, there were just, there were, there were way too many possibilities. Uh, so I limited myself to 10, um, in part in hopes that there might be groups who, who would study it. And in fact, 
Um, you asked me how it's being received. I know of five groups across the country uh, that are using it for some sort of a book club or book study. And uh, they, they make the drink or one of the, the alcoholic or the non-alcoholic drink. And then they enjoy it together, I think over Zoom right now um, while reading through the chapter. Yeah, well, I, I guess when, when you talk about uh, being a teacher, being a professor, working with students, here's an easy pitch to particularly college <laughs> students yeah. for getting to know the Bible better in your classes. Here you yeah. go, take this book, drink these 10 drinks. Yeah, it's, it doesn't seem that difficult to do it. And in fact, it's it's a lot of fun. I learned a lot about the drinks too, uh, yeah. John, which was really fun for me. I mean, I knew something about the texts, but I really learned some interesting things about the drinks. Well, we'll talk about that, but something I was uh, really curious about is how did you resist not pairing a passage like Mark 14, 24, right? Which is, uh, uh, I have it here, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, will not drink again for the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. I, I guess I'm using that question as a, one, how did you resist not pairing that? <laughs> specific passage or any other Eucharistic passages with uh, a full bodied red wine. And I guess I'm asking that as a as a way into people might be picking up the book or expecting that because there's so many references to alcohol in the Bible that that's what the book is about. So I guess how did you resist not specifically going with uh, 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 boozy passages and, and uh, have you kind of run into maybe this misperception that this is a book that is specifically about booze in the Bible? Uh, yes, uh, the latter question, yes. I have run into uh, people who think it's a, a book about the booze in the Bible, which is mostly wine actually, um, interestingly yeah. enough, um, because um, uh, I wrote a, uh, or I contributed to an article that Candida Moss wrote in the Daily Beast about uh, about ancient winemaking. I just uh, was a little part of that article that she wrote. But um, it's interesting that in the in the Holy Land, in, in ancient Palestine, wine um, was much more prevalently made than beer, which was also a very well-known ancient drink. Um, but it was because beer takes far more uh, water than wine does. And uh, Palestine is a very water uh, dry area. It lacks water. So, um, why didn't I pick up those particular passages? I think, uh, I mean, lots of people have talked about uh, the Eucharist, about uh, Christian communion, uh, about this is my body, this is my blood. Um, and I didn't want to talk about those so much because there are lots of theologians talking about that already. I, I really wanted to get into passages um, that where I could have fun with the politics of citation, where I could um, talk about uh, about justice issues, where I could maybe bring something that people hadn't thought about at all. Um, uh, so, um, uh, for instance, it's a little bit like I, uh, in Isaiah, I talk about mimosas and second Isaiah, which is a very celebratory portion of the, of the, uh, of the book of Isaiah. Um, and that's probably the closest I come to, to uh, talking about uh, biblical boozy passages that are already in the Bible. But you're right. Uh, there are some people who thought it, it is that. And I think that they don't realize that it's just, it's really more of a teaching tool where the uh, alcoholic connections are, or the drink connections, whether alcohol or not, are sometimes a, a bit, um, uh, I mean, I, I have fun uh, making the connections. Maybe they're a bit tenuous at times. Yes. Well, um, instead of starting at the genesis of the book at the beginning, because and you did just mention uh, uh, mimosas, but we're taping this during Advent. It's going to air as part of our holiday programming. As we've talked about, we're wishing everybody a new, a happy New Year. Uh, it's going to air on, on on New Year's. But what what's a good po a Bible passage to read with a mimosa in hand? Maybe as a treat if you're chanting the O antiphons during uh, the, the Advent season. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you uh, would be interested in this, but I, I actually, um, for the first, ad, uh, first of Advent, first Sunday of Advent, it happened that I had a book launch and I asked uh, people who were coming to the book launch online, the Zoom book launch, to, um, to come up with a pairing for the texts from Isaiah, or from Mark, I should say, um, about, uh, about the coming apocalyptic kingdom of God. And uh, people came up with some very interesting uh, texts, or some very interesting drinks, and I'm going to just read a couple of them for you. Please. One person said, a vodka martini shaken, not stirred, because God's coming into the world is truly an earth and heaven-shaking event. People will faint from fear and foreboding, Luke says. 
Um, so there's a shaken, not stirred uh, vodka martini a la um, um, James Bond. Uh, another person said Norwegian glog, um, which is a sort of a sweet, hot wine, a mulled wine. And they said, as the days get shorter and the temperature is cooler, it's helpful to have a little thing to warm us as this powerful lesson tells us to wait in anticipation. Um, another one that I particularly liked is a dark and stormy, mm -hmm. which I hadn't heard of before this cocktail, but it's a splash of rum in ginger beer served with lime. And uh, this, this person, who, um, Karen Lee from uh, Kelowna, Vernon or Kelowna, uh, British Columbia said that members of Bermuda's Royal Navy Officers Club described the ominous hue of the drink they'd invented as the color of a cloud only a fool or a dead man would sail under. Luke's gospel says the coming of the Son of Man will be preceded by celestial signs, global distress, a roaring of the sea and the powers of the heaven shaken. And into this dark confusion, unimaginable light eternal arrives in power and great glory. I thought that was a great pairing. And um, a final pairing is hibiscus flowering tea served with honey. You know those those teas that um, where the ball of tea is actually a flower that slowly unfolds as it steeps. Yes. And that's uh, the reason for that was the urge, despite the urgency with which Jesus tells his followers to prepare, 2000 years later, God still hasn't ended the empires to bring in this reign of peace and justice. So steeping flowering tea reminds us that we have to be patient. And so I loved all of those, those pairings. And uh, and I think that uh, during a celebratory time, uh, mimosa is a, um, in fact, in the book, I talk about Isaiah uh, 40 and, and 55 uh, and, and the mimosa, uh, which is perfect for New Year's Eve, uh, because it, 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 again, it has a kind of a justice emphasis. In Isaiah, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come and buy milk and wine without price, without money. So the idea that at the end of time, um, you do not, uh, finally, the poor are lifted up. Finally, uh, there is justice in this world. And, and one of the signs of the justice is that the, is that the poorest of the poor and those who have constantly been marginalized throughout history um, can, can purchase uh, rich food, including rich wine, uh, without price, without money. And um, so that, wouldn't that be a lovely New, Year's, uh, lovely New Year's Eve thing to have happen, to have this kind of reign of justice finally begin? And maybe yeah, accompanied yeah. by wine, mimosas. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm already depressed about 2022, but maybe this will be the year, <laughs> perhaps. I hope so. Yeah. Um, okay. So we can't go through the whole book, but, you know, I, I, I kind of semi-randomly chose, you know, a few of the chapters uh, to talk about some of the drinks and some of the themes. But right now I am drinking a nice, crisp Montreal or Quebec apple cider. Can you Here's tell us how... An apple cider can give us insight into the, and I put this into scare quotes, uh, quote unquote, the temptation of Eve. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I tried to do in the book is to um, is to really adopt uh, different lenses to take a look at the scripture. So um, a decolonizing approach and, a, and a, a feminist and gender aware approaches. And boy, when you start talking about um, apples and Eve, uh, you really get into uh, the politics of how scripture has been used throughout history. Um, one of the people who uh, blurbed the back cover of, of the book, I was very, very fortunate that one of the people who booked, uh, who blurbed the back color, cover, excuse me, is Dr. Katie Edwards, um, uh, who is a, is a UK um, broadcaster and writer. And uh, she is responsible. She wrote a book called Admin and Eve, very cute title. And in it, she points out uh, uh, how the story of Adam and Eve has consistently been used and reused and reused and reused throughout history um, to uh, villainize Eve. And there's a lot of very good scholarly work on this. Um, and, and, and then not only to villainize Eve, but then to set Eve up somehow as the opposite of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus, so that you have these two uh, polarized options for women, um, either the um, either the, the the virgin or the whore kind of uh, uh, options uh, through the male gaze, always through the male gaze, and um, and in fact, when you look at um, at the story of Adam and Eve, and the the creation narrative, the second creation account in Genesis, uh, starting in, in chapter two, verse four, um, you realize that these things are not there. Um, yeah. 
they're, they're just not there. Uh, this is where the history of reception of the Bible has taken over and added meanings that people think is in the text, but in fact is not there. And um, uh, so, for instance, with the apple, I mean, even the apple is not there. Uh, it's just called the fruit of the tree. And um, whether it was an apple or not, uh, you know, it may have been a pomegranate. In fact, it very likely could have been a pomegranate that was intended as the fruit of the story. Um, I liked to think it was an apple, and that allowed me to get into the, the history of cider. And it's quite interesting that, uh, and I didn't know this, that um, cider is, again, like wine, um, is a colonizing drink. When the Romans, um, for instance, invaded uh, Britain at the time, before it was England, it was Britain. When they invaded Britain, um, that was what the first time, the first one of the first mentions of cider is Caesar. Uh, talking about the Britons who made um, cider, apple cider from their crab apples, sort of a, a small apple, wildish apple. And the Romans, when they invaded, took over those uh, apple orchards, kicked out the Britons, installed their own people, and installed their own sweeter, larger apples and created uh, this apple cider, which then later Jerome, uh, oddly enough, seems to have been the uh, Saint Jerome of the, one of the doctors of the church, very strange fellow, by the way, um, uh, seems to have been the one who coined the term cider. So as I was uh, researching these these kinds of things, I kept coming across these strange links. Um, I would think that I was kind of facetiously making a link between apple cider and uh, the story uh, from Genesis. But in fact, I would find again and again and again links that went on and on. But in a very serious way, um, this villainization of Eve um, has continued uh, even to our own day. And when you see advertising very, very often, um, even for ciders, quite often you will see yeah. um, a very sexy uh, woman who is um, who is looking at the camera with some sort of an alluring look. And then there's the idea uh, of an apple and a male, kind of a befuddled male. And the idea being a little temptation isn't bad for you. You'll see that kind of theme again and again in the advertising. And the idea of linking um, temptation with gender, with with uh, with women in this case, and then somehow you can blame um, whatever, uh, if there are any ill consequences of an act, you can somehow blame that on on the woman. And of course, uh, feminist and gender um, hermeneutic uh, uh, lenses looking at these texts point out how this was um, this was something that was adopted as a way of. Uh, again, of consolidating power with males, of pushing women out of leadership roles in the church and the uh, synagogue, um, and um, as a way of keeping women in their place uh, during, especially during times of uh, relative relaxation. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, Katie Edwards points out in her book is that this kind of rhetoric around um, Eve tends to occur in historical periods where uh, women are finally gaining some justice uh. in society. And then all of a sudden there's a kind of a pushback. And that pushback is off, has historically in, in our culture often been associated with this story in some way or another with the, with the image of Eve. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's fascinating, but it's also very, very tragic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, I have to put in, you know, if only there had been a community of ancient Christians that had rewritten Genesis where Eve is the hero and eating the fruit was a heroic act. And man, history would have been so different. Uh, one other uh, connection between uh, uh, cider and colonial uh, 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 colonization uh, is um, you've heard of the famous Johnny Appleseed who went from coast to coast in America planting apples trees. Well, he was planting them for cider. And that was part of the colonial American project was to plant apple trees from coast to coast because they were so useful. I mean, mostly for cider, but of course, apples were, were also turned into apple molasses, which was the primary form of colonial sugar and turned into cider and turned into food and foodstuffs for animals. So there's a strong link in North America, too, between colonization and, and uh, apples and apple cider. So very, very interesting connections and very interesting, you know, and then, of course, you we don't have the time. Then we could also talk about the connections between uh, uh, colonialization and um, misogyny. Um, oh, yes. However, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's at least good that you point that out. Absolutely, colonization, misogyny. I mean, it's often the patriarchal urge to control, to call something a frontier, to uh, to to control. All, absolutely, totally in agreement. Yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, but moving on, and, and you did already touch on this, but how can a gin and tonic help us to understand colonization and, and help Christians reflect upon it? Well, uh, firstly, I hope that it's not just Christians who reflect on it, but all people who can reflect on it. And I and I know, I mean, the book is a is a kind of a it's a Christiany book in some ways, but it it is uh, the the scriptures have affected many many people um, of all faiths and no faith. And, uh, and I have certainly written it in an attempt to try and uh, talk to people about um, decolonization, which is, for instance, uh, or peace, uh, period, uh, topics which uh, are for everyone. Uh, so how can anyone read this book and, and look at a gin and tonic and think about decolonization? Actually, gin and tonic is a really good example because, um, uh, it, well, it, it brings two things together. I, I like to think of uh, another theme in the book is the theme of land. And that um, one of the things that colonization has done to us and for us has been to disconnect us from the land where we are. And, and so in that sense, I'm really fascinated by the, um, by the blossoming of interest in local gins that use... Um, that use botanicals from a local area. So, for instance, right. in Mon in Montreal, the uh, the circa gin uh, uses um, uh, uh, black spruce um, and and other botanicals from uh, that area of Montreal of Quebec, um, and the same across the country uh, and and many and here, for instance, in Ireland, where I am at present, uh, certain there are gins from. Uh, the Wicklow Mountains, south of Dublin, that use botanicals from there. So there's this, that's a very good thing. On the other hand, um, gin and tonic became the sort of signature drink of the British Empire. And gin comes from Jennifer, from uh, William of Orange, who brought it over and and, um, and was part of, 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 in fact, William of Orange here in, in Ireland uh, is a character who is known as being the sort of beginning of the colonization uh, of, of Ireland. Yes. Um, and, um, and so you've got this history with gin of colonization and then tonic on top of that, uh, tonic comes, um, is, was adopted or was invented, was uh, popularized as an anti-malarial for its quinine. And um, the British empire, people said, ran on, on, on tonic, on gin and tonic. Uh, because that was what the officers of the British Empire would drink, the uh, tonic for its anti-malarial properties, because what were they doing? They were in sub-Saharan Africa, they were in uh, South Asia, uh, the, the, uh, the, the trading companies, they were, they were doing all of this, they were um, taking over areas such as Assam. And that, was, that brings me actually to the other drink um, of that chapter, which is the tea. And um, I mean, a lot of people don't realize when they have their cup of tea that this tea uh, in its origins was part of the opium trade that England was pushing onto China um, and forcing China in the opium wars to leave their ports open because the Brits did not want to sail ships back empty. Um, so it's amazing. A capital, uh, so capitalism, uh, patriarchy, colonization, these things are all wrapped up in what we drink and what we eat, and we don't always realize it. And um, g and gin and tonic, boy, that's a powerful uh, symbol still. But it can, I, I, in the chapter, in the book, I try and point to the hopeful future. And maybe here, because this is a New Year's Eve program, we can look at 2022 and we can say that g and in your hand might be a hopeful symbol of how we can start doing what Indigenous scholars have said we should all do, and that is pay attention to the land that we're on. Um, and especially if it's a treaty land or a land that uh, belongs to someone else, the Ganyagahaga uh, or the um, Anishinaabe or the uh, Nehiwak. Um, if, if we pay attention to the land that we're on, we will all be the better for it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, the last question I have on the sheet, um, which which actually I have to add a little uh, uh, addition to, which is, okay, so most of our audience is, of course, outside of Canada. But you, I, I guess if you could go back, you mentioned a, uh, a, a mysterious drink, a mysterious potion called a Molson. 
um, which I would have gotten for this evening. And perhaps our mutual friend Sarah Parks, she could agree or disagree. But I used to play in an indie rock band in the Maritimes. Yep. And how we were paid was in endless Molson X. And I cannot drink it, smell it, and look at it anymore. Okay, so um, the two-part question. What is this mysterious Molson? And then can you tell us what the heck a bloody Caesar is for all these non-Canadians? And what a bloody Caesar has to do with the end of the world? Okay, so first, firstly, a Molson. Um, that was the chapter where I talked about Psalm 139. And Psalm 139, um, one of the great lines of Psalm 139 is, um, even if I should take the wings of the morning and settle at the far edges of the sea, even there your hand shall, I'm quoting, so I may get a couple words wrong, even there your hand shall hold me tight, even there your strong arm will, keep, will hold me. Uh, it's part of the Hebrew Psalms. Um, it's a it's a song of worship, but it's a psalm about being at home. And um, and by the way, uh, it, just again, when we think that these things don't have uh, are sort of only in the Bible and they never come out of, of a church or out of a synagogue or out of a place of worship and affect us in our daily lives, I also teach a class on theology and film. And um, we studied. We were taking a look at the the Truman Show, which is an old movie now. But at the very end of the Truman Show, the movie, um, as Jim as Jim Carrey's uh, Truman uh, person is sailing across uh, the water on the sailboat, the directors of the Truman Show put 139 on the sail. And I am 100% sure that that was for Psalm 139 because he was sailing to the far edges of the sea where even there, Christoph, the director of the show, um, was with him and he couldn't, he couldn't escape it. But <clears throat> for Psalm 139, it's supposed to be a very comforting thought. And um, I, I, we're, I'm speaking to you right now from Dublin and Molson is a Canadian beer company. And I found it very interesting that we went, uh, Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah Parks, who's my partner and I went to the little local store here called the Centra. And uh, we walked into uh, to it and guess what was the beer on sale? Molson Canadian. So what did we do? Of course, we had to have a Molson Canadian. And I sat back, we both sat back with one of these Molson Canadians and had a drink. And I mean, I love English lager. I love uh, Guinness here in Dublin. I love Guinness. But there was something about that, uh, or sorry, English ale. I said English lager, English ale or um, Guinness. But we sat back with these Molson Canadians and it was just this dry, crisp taste that we loved. Why did we love it? because it reminded us of home. Yes, and yes. Um, that chapter is all about the drinks that remind us of home, whether that's just a drip coffee or whatever it might be. So that's where the Molson comes in. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a taste of home. And I think that, um, um, you know, uh, we are, we're sensual beings and uh, we learn through our senses and we remember through our senses um, very much. So a taste of something will just take us back in time. It might take us to a different place. And uh, that's where Molson comes in. Now, the Bloody Caesar. Um, the Bloody Caesar is, is supposedly the archetypal Canadian drink, but it is one weird thing. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll just read you the, the, the recipe for it. Please. Uh, from the book, because it, it, is, it is a weird, weird drink. Um, and I, I love Bloody Caesars. I mean, I grew, it's again, a taste of home for me. Yeah, but me here, here it is. A Bloody Caesar, rim a tall glass with celery salt or seasoning salt or Montreal steak spice. Over ice cubes, pour a shot of vodka and eight ounces of Clamato juice. Now Clamato juice is like tomato juice with crushed clams. Yeah. Um, it's, it's great. It gives it great flavor. Um, this is the big departure from the Bloody Mary, and it makes a significant improvement in taste and texture. That's what makes it a real Canadian drink. Splash in <clears throat> several squirts of Worcestershire sauce, along with Tabasco sauce to taste. Sprinkle with black pepper, squeeze in some fresh lime. Now you're starting to get the picture. It's a weird drink. Yeah. Um, give it all a stir and then add a long stalk of celery. That's the drink's traditional garnish. And um, by the way, you can do this very easily uh, as a virgin, what's called a virgin Caesar name Virgin Caesar is kind of problematic, but a non-alcoholic Caesar um, by simply substituting pickle juice or lemon juice for the vodka, also very good. But that's a bloody Caesar. Yeah. And um, Most people have turned off the show. <laughs> Just <laughs> listening. Sorry, all the non-Canadians have turned <coughs> off the show listening to the, the recipe. And it's, a, it's a great drink. You it's a great try. drink. Yeah. It's a really, really, it's a it really refreshing, is. interesting drink. 
but like the book of Revelation in the Bible, um, you can make it too salty and too strong and too powerful, yeah. and it can it can turn bad. Um, when it's at its best, it's great, um, but it can also be a bit of a. Uh, it can be leave the leave some of the salt in the bottom of the glass. You're probably best to yes. do that. And Revelation, of course, also features secretly a bloody Caesar, right? Yes. <laughs> in six one six or six six six. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's full of uh, references to the Caesars, to to Nero, uh, with the six six six, and and um, and to the overthrow of the Roman Empire. And it's a bloody book, even though it ends with this beautiful, uh, such a beautiful yeah. vision that people uh, use very often. Revelation twenty one at funerals, you know, God is with people. Will wipe every tear from people's eyes. Um, there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. But but boy, there's a lot of blood on the way there. Uh, in the book of Revelation. Yeah, there sure is. Well, Dr. Anderson, this seems like a uh, a good point to end, and hopefully 2022 is not what happens in the book of Revelation, although I do love how it that book ends. So yeah. I'd be okay if we could skip over everything to that part. So uh, it's been so amazing having you. Uh, Happy New Year, Dr. Anderson. Before we end the show, I've been flashing this up on the screen, but for those listening, not paying attention, could you tell people where to find the book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my, uh, the book is available through Novalis Press, but if you're in the United States or in Europe or somewhere uh, um, other than Canada, the best way to do it would be to, for my blog, somethinggrand.ca, that's two Gs, somethinggrand.ca. And then there's pairings, the Bible and booze, and there are buttons there to order it from anywhere in the world, pretty much. Fantastic. And for those who are listening to this as a podcast, it will be in the, the notes below. Uh, so again, uh, many thanks and uh, please come back on. We were talking before the show, but now uh, I can lock it in because it will be public. Please come back on to talk about pilgrimage, which I know is a, uh, a topic that's very uh, uh, close to your heart. So I'd, uh, I'd love yeah. to. And ha Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Bye.